Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. This is a non-judgmental place to explore spirituality, and we're so glad you're here. This is a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we greatly appreciate your support. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Be sure and like, share, and subscribe to any of the social media content platforms that you're using. And then if you go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, you can make a one-time donation or with a monthly subscription, you'll gain access to our bonus content. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. We're glad you're tuning in with us. Today we have, I, I mean, I've interviewed some fascinating people, but I, I must say Khalid Abdul Qadir yeah. is easily one of my most fascinating interviews. I've been so intrigued by, you know, just learning about your life, Khalid, and, and, and thanks so much for being on Spirituality Adventures. Thank you. I appreciate it. Happy to be here. Yeah. So just, just to let you know, Khalid has an amazing family background. We're going to talk about that. He's, he was in the Navy military career. He's a writer, director, yep. uh, highly educated guy, just uh, amazing, amazing life journey. So uh, let's jump into it. Okay. <laughs> so tell us, first of all, where did you, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Tell us a little bit about your family background. So I was born in Wichita, Kansas. Oh, me too. Really? Yeah. Wesley Medical Center. I was uh, uh Saint what did they call it? Uh Saint Francis Hospital, I think. Oh, okay, I think it's it. still yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a mental health ward now. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was born it's in uh appropriate for my birth and appropriate for me now. So anyway. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um yeah, born in Wichita, Kansas. Um, what high school did you go to, or did you go to high school in Wichita? No, I I went to I went to three high schools actually. Okay. Yeah. So uh, born in Wichita, but we moved to Kansas City when I was young. Uh, my mother uh, came down with breast cancer, and uh, she passed while we were living here. Uh, I think I was three years old, mm -hmm. and then from there there was a lot of movement. Okay. But by the time I got to high school, I started in St. Louis. I did uh, freshman, sophomore year there. I came back to Kansas City, did half of my junior year at Ruskin. Then I went back to St. Louis, finished my junior year. And then my senior year, I moved to Norman, went to Norman, Oklahoma, Norman High. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you were around. My uh, re my dad graduated from Wichita North oh, okay. back in the 50s. You know? wow, so yeah. anyway, that's why I was <laughs> I was wondering. But no, gosh. So I don't. does Ruskin still exist? Yeah. Does it? I think so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which one closed? The the one there was one near Ruskin that closed. One of the high schools. Ah. I anyway, I forgot. That wasn't too long ago. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, was it Hickman Mills? Yeah, Hickman Mills. Oh, okay. I thought is I Hickman heard Mills something. closed? I think it is. I thought I heard. Something I think it about is. That. Yeah. 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 Hickman Mills. Well, interesting. Um. So, um, what did your what did your dad do? Uh, now. Well, when you were growing up. <laughs> Uh, he was actually, he was a, a, a pretty high level, uh, manager at AT&T. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he worked at AT&T. He worked here, um, in Kansas city. Mm -hmm. And then when AT&T split, you know, in AT&T and Southwestern Bell, um, he got sent to man an office in Atlanta. <clears throat> okay. And so we lived right outside of, uh, we lived in Kennesaw, Georgia. Um, not too far away from Atlanta. And I've been, been, been I went to rehab right near there. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So not the best <laughs> memories of my life anyway, yeah. but anyway, yeah, no. Yeah. But yeah, he, huh. um, you know, he was working there and then, you know, I remember, you know, he just quit. You know what I mean? He, uh, you know, my dad went through like ebbs and flows of, uh, being really, uh, observant of his faith <clears throat> and then, you know, like falling out of it and you know, mm -hmm. completely out of it. Okay. And so, um, he went into one of those observation periods, I guess I can call it. And he just walked away from the corporate life. And I, I actually still have like the document from AT&T where the supervisor like typed up why they're letting him go. <clears throat> and it says like he, 
He told them he was leaving. They were like, we'll give you a year paid. You go do whatever you need to do and then come back. He was like, I'll take the year paid, but I ain't coming back. Mm. And then he didn't return, so they terminated him. Interesting. So, yeah. yeah, so that that's what happened. What did he do after that? We moved from Kennesaw, Georgia. We were living in a um, a what used to be a plantation home. <clears throat> Six bedrooms. Driveway was a quarter mile long. We had 80 pine trees in the front yard alone. And we moved from that to a dilapidated uh, multifamily unit in Oklahoma City. Um, and we became part of an Islamic community there in Oklahoma. Okay. And, you know, no furniture. So we went from, I guess you could call it wealthy or somewhat well off, <clears throat> to then, you know, not having any furniture, sleeping on the floor in Oklahoma City. Yeah. Yeah. So was your dad um, Muslim growing up himself? Did no. Did he grow up in a Muslim family? No. So no? He, he converted to Islam. He. Um, <clears throat> so is Abdul Qadir your dad? Your dad's converted name? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what was I, his name prior to that? Melvin Lattimore. Okay. Yeah. I, my first name's always been Khalid. My last name was Lattimore, though. Okay. And uh, he changed my name in 1989. All right. In Cobb County, Georgia. <laughs> 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 yeah. And uh, yeah. So, so now you're black and Muslim. Right. Right. right you know right, what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so, yeah, he, uh, you know, he, he dabbled with the idea of Islam, um, which, you know, it, it spread through the African-American community right. in the fifties and sixties. Yeah. It, it, it actually, it was really prominent on the East coast because that's where a lot, most of the Arabs had really settled in the, uh, early 1900s. Um, and you know, a lot of African-Americans that were, disenfranchised or upset with the conditions, you know, they were looking for anything that wasn't white and wasn't Christian. Right. And so Islam just happened to be, yeah. that. it served that purpose. Right. So, right. Yeah. You know. I've read several biographies on Malcolm X, mm -hmm. which, are, which is fascinating. I think anybody should read a biography on him. Absolutely. Fascinating life. And then of course, you know, Hamalad Ali and, you know, I mean, yeah. that it was a, a huge, black Muslim movement in, in America. Right. And, uh, and, and most of them weren't, you know, they weren't not like they were, they were just took a different approach to civil rights than say Martin Luther King Jr. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And so my dad was up in that, you know, he, he was a black Panther. He was down with the nation of Islam. Uh, he had an opportunity to meet Malcolm X one time at a seminar mm. and got to, you know, shake a hand and mm -hmm. say something to him. Uh, and it was after Malcolm X had returned uh, from Mecca. Right. And shortly before he died. And so uh, he's talked about what that, you know, 40 second conversation was, but that 40 second conversation really changed. It changed his uh, approach to Islam. Okay. Yeah. So that's when he also got off of like the nation Islam thing and started looking for something that was more, Orthodox, I guess you could say mm -hmm. traditional, right. uh, Arab based, mm -hmm. uh, Islam, Sunni, right. Sunni. Yeah. For people who've known me for a long years, um, and especially from my vineyard church years, they, people wouldn't remember that I worked at the, you know, I went to the national prayer breakfast and helped, helped host the middle East suite mm. for the national prayer breakfast. And we brought in, we brought in some, some Jewish, uh, leaders and businessmen, but, a lot of Arab Muslims. We probably had almost a hundred Arab Muslims coming into the national prayer breakfast and we'd be interacting with the Muslim. These are mostly businessmen, but some imams mm -hmm. and um, which is kind of like a pastor right. for the Muslim world for those, yep. you know, and uh, fascinating. <clears throat> I, I made some great friends. I've traveled in the Middle East. I've been to Lebanon, Syria, um, Jordan, Palestine, Egypt, uh, been to, um, the, uh, oh crud. What's the big, what do they call it? The Vegas of the middle East. Um, I was going to say Lebanon, but we're trying to United, Dubai, United, 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 United
I don't, yeah, yeah. United Arab Emirates. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and the capital, which is the, they call it the Vegas of the Middle East. Yeah. But they, they got the tallest building in the world there. You know, uh-huh. the Khalifa. Yeah. Deal. Anyway. Yeah. Abu Dhabi. Yeah, yeah. I've been there. Yeah. So anyway, interesting stuff. So tell us about what happened with your, with your dad and kind of then how that affected you and your journey. Yeah. So, um, in high school, uh, you know, the reason I got to moving around so much was because my dad was going through one of those periods where he wasn't on the faith thing, you know, he was out there and, uh, you know, bad habits. And, um, so I left St. Louis and I moved to Kansas city to live with my aunt and he moved from St. Louis to Norman, Oklahoma to get back with a, uh, uh, an Islamic community that he was familiar with. And so once I moved back to St. Louis, he wasn't happy about that. Cause St. Louis is, is a treacherous place. If anybody doesn't know about it. Uh, so he came back and were you East St. Louis? We, well, I, we actually live right downtown. So, okay. you know, yeah. not too far from East St. Louis yeah. right there on the river. So, okay. um, he moved back or he, he came back to St. Louis and he asked me to move to Norman and I didn't want to go, you know, I was going to school. I was happy. Uh, and if you didn't know, St. Louis had a desegregation program, you know, when I was in high school. And so even though I lived in the city, I was bused to the suburbs to go to high school. And so, um, I don't want to go. And he said, all right, if you just, just come visit Norman for three days and then make your decision. I was like, okay. So I went to visit. He knew what he was doing. He took me to the high school, Norman high. And I saw the football stadium and this is Oklahoma football, six, a, you know, it's a different world. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, I was sold then because that's what I was trying to be was a football player. Okay. Yep. So left St. Louis for the second time, moved to Norman, Oklahoma. Um, we lived like right down the street from Oklahoma University's football stadium. I think the intersection is Lindsay and Jenkins. It's like right on the corner. And uh, yeah, and we attended the mosque there and it was a pretty big mosque. Uh, I think they had, they probably had at least four or 500 uh, regular, uh, members. And there was an individual that I met shortly after I arrived there. We knew him as Shaquille, Shaquille. And later on, you know, we found out that his name was Zacharias Musawi. Um, so what ended up happening was, so just for the audience who doesn't know who that is. Oh, so Zacharias Musawi is the 20th hijacker. He's the only man alive who's actually charged with the crime of 9-11. Mm-hmm. So the first time I met this guy, I was 17. I think I just turned 17. Mm-hmm. And um, he immediately would criticize me, you know, about everything. You know I mean? When he heard that I was playing football and, you know, I was, in that, I, I was living like a double life at the time because here I am at this huge high school, you know, I'm new, I'm a first year senior, but I come in, I take the starting running back position. Uh, I'm extremely popular. You know, I have girls, drugs, doing everything. But at the same time, I'm at the mosque, you know, every day trying to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's a small town. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, so he, he used to just, you know, point that out all the time because I guess he was aware. Masawi. Yeah, Masawi. I'm sure he was aware. And yeah. I'm sure other people were too, but I guess they just left me alone. But he would he would criticize me all the time. So we had He was a part of your mosque. Yeah. Yep. And he when you say he was the twentieth, mm-hmm. what does that mean? The tw- that's that's just what, what the FBI ended up or I guess he, the, the was, media ended up yeah. deeming him that. Okay. But I guess there were nineteen and then he was a 20th one. Definitely had an involvement with it though. Is that right? Well, you know what? I'm gonna tell you the truth. So the FBI detained Musawi in August of 2001. 2001, okay. Yeah, it was a month before 9-11 even happened. Okay. Um, And when I first moved to Norman, the first time I seen the guy, me and my dad were sitting in the mosque and he comes walking in 
And my dad was like, you see that guy right there? I'm like, yeah. He was like, I think he's an FBI agent. <laughs> that, yeah, that wow. was almost, yeah, that was a year and a half before 9-11 interesting yeah so it was a lot of you know it was a lot of cloak and dagger yeah. and all kinds of stuff going on interesting yeah wow yeah so 9-11 happens um there was a uh a guy named hussein alatas who the three of us we lived together me my dad and hussein and he was about 22 years old he was a student at oklahoma university um but then my dad wanted to get remarried, so Hussein had to move out. And he didn't have nowhere to move, so Musawi offered for Hussein to move in to his place. And so um, when the FBI detained Musawi, they detained uh, Hussein as well. And so my dad was in contact with Hussein's family, and they wanted him to help get Hussein out of jail or from being held or whatever and so my dad went to inquire about that and then that's where the fbi was like oh yeah you you already have a a colorful black uh background and so the fact that you know you're coming to see about this guy there's something there mm. and um after 9 11 happened we dealt with the fbi on a daily basis for like a month you know they would come meet us. They'd be like, have you ever had any conversations about this? You know, ask us all these questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk and it was, it was uh, very cordial. You know, they even, you know, they bought us lunch one time. You know, it wasn't a, wasn't a problem. It wasn't until a month later in October where my dad did a, a news segment live on TV. And he said that 9-11 uh, was an inside job. And that night, our relationship with the FBI changed. Hmm. Yeah. So they detained him as a material witness to testify against Musawi. That's what he was detained for. Okay. Um, and then after he testified, then they also charged him with sedition and levy war against the United States. Your dad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, bombing conspiracy. Uh, they sought the death penalty. And he beat the case with a public defender. Um, but then they br they brought him back to Oklahoma and they charged him as a felon in possession of firearms. And so mm. he ended up serving a two-year sentence for that. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So how did that affect your world? Your life. Oh, man. Shoo. Man. So, you know, like I said. So you're a football star I, yeah. at the big 6A high school in Norman, <laughs> Oklahoma. Yeah. Probably surrounded by a lot of white folks. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> now your dad is. Yeah. 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 So what, what, what happens in Khalid's life at this juncture? Well, my, my brother, you know, Muhammad was also a football player. And he was he was so good at what he did playing football that I was being offered scholarships because of him. I so, figured the genetics are good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pittsburgh State. Oh yeah. Pittsburgh State came sure. down to, to visit me. They offered me a full ride. The gorillas. The gorillas. Uh -huh. They offered me a full <laughs> ride. And they at that meeting they said nothing about me. Mm. They only talked about my brother. Mm. Um so I was being heavily recruited. But my dad wanted me to go to uh, Senegal, West Africa, and study Quran. He wanted me to be a hafiz, you know, where you yeah. memorize the Quran from front to back. And so my whole senior year, I'm how, like. How do you say that? Hafiz. Hafiz? I always yeah. said hafiz, but is that <laughs> hafiz? Hafiz, yeah. Hafiz, okay. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm struggling with this my entire senior year because, like, you know, my brother's this big college football star. That's my dream was to play football. I'm successful playing football. I'm getting recruited. And my dad is asking me to like devote my life to Islam. You know what I mean? And so uh, I ended up agreeing to it. Shortly before graduation, I said, you know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna 
turn down all the scholarships. I'm going a, I'm to a do it. I'm going to walk away from all the cheerleaders and everything, you know, that I was involved with uh, and devote my life to that. So I turned down all the, the scholarships um, and I was supposed to start. I was going to go. I was going to do my first semester uh, in college. And then the following year, I was going to travel to Senegal. And um, but September happened and changed mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, so. My dad was removed out of the house by the feds. And as I said, my mother died when I was young. So I was just by myself. Mm. Yeah. You're 17. I just turned 18. 18. So I, okay. I turned 18 eight days. My birthday was on the third. So eight days before 9 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was, it was, it was weird to, to see because it was like the entire community split where like half the people, you know, became like very aggressive towards me. You know, this is Oklahoma now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then the other half, they were like, uh, I don't know. It was like a, it was like the underground railroad. You know what I mean? Like I had people who would like, you know, leave food on my porch. You know, I would be out somewhere and like, you know, somebody would come up behind me and they'd be like, even people I didn't know, mm. but they, they, people knew me cause I was playing football in this town Yeah, and they'd be like, Hey, I know, you, I know your father didn't have anything to do with that. If you need anything. You know, call this number. Okay, yeah, it was yeah, it was crazy. Mm. I I got a job at the um, at the uh, PetSmart. Okay, there. yeah, uh, cleaning the animal cages, and you know the guy who hired me. You know, he was a real you know freedom fighter. I guess you know he uh, he didn't want to pay me. You know, he wanted to pay me cash. You know, he would leave the door open. And I would come in at night. Hmm. You know, I guess, I guess he felt like he was really uh, helping me because a lot of people felt like I was, you know, being because I kind of just got accused as a result of what was happening to my dad. Yeah. Like guilty by association. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, if your dad's a terrorist, you are. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I I was attacked twice. So I, I was attacked the first time it was before my dad was detained. And uh, I got jumped by a group of people. And after that happened, that's when my dad armed, you know, he had a pistol or two beforehand. But after that, he was like, you know, this is like, we, we, we could be, we could be killed as a result of the situation. And so, you know, it was really like we had weapons by the, by each window, you know what I mean? Yeah. And and that's what the feds ended up coming in, and they were like, "See, yeah, he's a terrorist. Look at all these guns in here." <clears throat> but he loaded up like that because I had almost gotten beat to death, you know right. what I mean? Um, and then I got jumped a second time by some people I knew, some people I went to went to high school with. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and wow. that that was you know, and my dad was removed by then and and that moment was when i really realized that you know my world was was over or mm. different you know yeah. what i mean yeah interesting mm -hmm. you know it's interesting i <clears throat> i was you know starting vineyard church and we'd met in a middle school um not too far from where we're doing this interview mm -hmm. and we had we'd bought land and built a new building up here on 169 up toward Smithville, still in Kansas City, Missouri. And we had our grand opening Sunday in this new facility um, the Sunday after 9-11. Mm. So we'd, we'd sent out a grand opening mailer, invited the whole Northland to our new church, you know. not uh, Obviously, the mailers hit, you know, we sent those out way before 9-11, but they were hitting people's mailbox almost exactly like that, Monday, you know, nine eleven was a Tuesday, Wednesday, and then our serv our opening, our grand opening was the next Sunday. So yeah. We went from four hundred to eight hundred people in one week. Wow. People showed up at church like crazy after nine eleven. And um and I had already been working in the Middle East with Arab Muslims. Yeah. So I had two different people into my church 
to talk about loving Muslims, you know, like in a mostly white <laughs> Northland, Kansas City. Yeah. Church. Uh-huh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How'd that go? <laughs> yeah. You know, but, well, you know, I would say like, well, hey, if you're a Jesus follower, you know, Jesus said, well, let's just say Muslims are enemies. And I didn't want to, you know, necessarily say that, but I said, let's right. say even if they were, mm-hmm. then what are we supposed to do if we're followers of Jesus? We're supposed to love our enemies, right? So yeah. Yeah, that's how I played it. You uh-huh. know? <laughs> and then and me and a buddy went down to one of the local mosques and offered to just, serve and clean up and just wanted to show our love for them yeah. you know down in May, there's there was one down in it was the only one i could find because there, there isn't one in the northland they're trying right. to get one built up here but um at the time this was you know 9 11 it was it's one down by bannister what the old bannister mall which isn't there anymore either but mm-hmm. uh any rate we went down there and they were having a, a conference on holy jihad trying to explain their people yeah know, and I think yeah. they were more of a progressive Muslim thing. So they were not, you know, they were not militant Muslims. Yeah. And um, it was so fascinating. At first, I think they thought we were coming there to bomb the place or something. But then yeah. then they were like, they realized we were had a <laughs> humble heart. And mm-hmm. it was a pretty powerful experience. They were super kind. As, you know, if you've traveled in the Arab Muslim world, you, you know, the hospitality, Muslim yeah. hospitality is top notch. You yeah. Know? some of the kindest people I've ever met. Right. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway, yeah. that was, that was kind of my nine 11 world. <laughs> wow. Quite different from yours. Yeah. yeah very different. <laughs> you know, I, I got to the point, you know, uh, where, you know, I, I wouldn't leave the house. I, I would wake up on my bed to the, the sunlight, like passing through my blinds and I would lay there until I went to sleep and the sun was going down. Yeah. Just fear. Yeah. And yeah. I was just completely, in a in a in a twilight zone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, take yeah. us from there. Yeah. Okay. So what, once the once the lights and the uh, you know the electricity and the water went off <laughs> in the house, yeah, I didn't know nothing about paying bills. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I joined the military. I joined the military. What was your thought? You know, you what? joined an American military. Yep. So I um, I used to uh, there was a gas station. Uh, near my house, and I saw his, that's where I was getting anything I wanted to eat. It's pretty much just candy and stuff, and um, the, it was in a like a strip mall, and in the corner there was the recruit depot or whatever. And so I remember being out there, and um, I tried to call my brother on the payphone, you know, call his dorm room. And, you know, he was trying to leave college and come, you know, and all this, and I'm like, man, stay where you at. You know, keep playing football. And uh which college was he playing? At that time he was at Coffeeville Community College. Okay. Yeah. And you know, his situation got derailed as well. He ended up not going to the NFL as a result of that. Mm. But um I saw some some young people who looked about my age going in and out of this uh military building. It was this like a recruiting recruiter station. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh and they had they had some food. Yeah, they had little plates, you know, and they were having like some kind of event over there. Mm. I needed to eat. <laughs> so I went over there. I got, you know, can I get a plate or something? Yeah, they gave me some grapes and some blueberries and stuff and some cake. And then, you know, start asking me questions. What, so what are you, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> Did you graduate from high school? Yeah. This and that. And I remember uh, my, the recruiter who I ended up being recruited by, he sat me down at his desk. He had a globe on the desk. And he was like, if you could go anywhere in the world, and it was the perfect thing I needed to hear, if I could get out of here. Mm. You know, he was like, if you could go anywhere in the world, where would it be? And I grabbed that globe, and I put my finger on where we were, and I put my other finger on the other side of the planet. I was like, over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, well, we can get you there. Oh, man. And I was like, well, let's go. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. This was a Navy guy. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, there wasn't any thought process behind it at the time, mm-hmm. but it turned out to be like a master stroke. Yeah. It totally confused the FBI. Describe that for me. Yeah. So, you know, after my dad was removed, the FBI turned up the uh, intensity on me. And let me tell you how the FBI works for the record, <laughs> if they're watching. <laughs> what the FBI does is they will systematically break break you down. They will start to 
to uh, they will start to injure different components of your life to coerce you to do things that they want you to do. You know what I mean? Uh, and they'll also engage you with different agents, depending on what your psychology or what you're into and all this kind of stuff like that. And so uh, they finally got me to the point where I, I broke and they were going to have me wear wires and go meet people. And I was going to be a full on informant. Mm. And, um, and then uh, that night in the middle of the night where the next morning, this was supposed to start is when I, I fled, basically I fled my house and I ended up like just sleeping outside and you know, on the, in the back of the, the gas station in the bushes, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, um, so when I, when I joined the military, well, first of all, I thought that as soon as these guys like do anything with my name, somebody's going to show up here. They're going to kick you out. Be, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I thought that the whole way through from the recruiter station to the bus ride, to the, to the MEP station where they do your physical, to the airport, to Great Lakes, Illinois, to the the military, to boot camp. You know, where, where'd you do boot camp? In Great Lakes, Illinois. Okay. At the whole time, I'm like, okay, now any moment, yeah, you're gonna somebody's get gonna, yeah, yeah, <laughs> somebody's gonna say you can't be here, and uh, it never happened. It mm -hmm. never happened. Uh, not per se. Uh, it wasn't so. I was in the military now for probably about six months. I had gone through boot camp and now I was in core school. I was a Navy corpsman. It's like a combat medic. I was attached to the Marines. And so I was going through core school, which was also in Chicago. And um, they brought us all in this auditorium and they announced that uh, we were about to go to war in Iraq. Mm. And I was like, okay. I was like, yeah, you know what? That's what I need to do. I need to go over there and I need to uh, demonstrate, you know, who I am, who my family is, who we're not, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I actually became really uh, focused and driven on trying to get over to the Middle East and I wanted to enact some damage. Mm. You know what I mean? I actually put in nine requests to go to Iraq mm. and they wouldn't let me go. Interesting. So uh, while we were in that auditorium, these two men come in, the, in there with these dusty suits on, you know what I'm saying? And I see them to this day. I can spot an agent. I don't, I don't care who you are. You know mm. what I mean? And um, they got to looking around and I, you know, it's, 80 people in here, but I see these two guys. I know they're there for me. I'm like, wow, here it is. And sure enough, they talked to the Lieutenant up there and the Lieutenant's like point me out, you know, and they're like, Hey, come on. I come over there. I'm like, what, what? Okay. What we got to do? They're like, come, you know, come get in the car with us. We go get in the car. They're like, you want a Gatorade? Or no. What, what, how's it going to happen? What's going to happen now? We'll tell you when we get to the, to the building. So they take me to this office. We go in there. They turn out to be NCIS agents, <laughs> right? Naval Criminal <laughs> Investigation Service, like the TV uh, show. Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking they're about to explain to me how I'm about to get processed out of the military or whatever, but they don't. They actually start talking to me about uh, working as a, a agent for NCIS. Hmm and approaching targets in the Navy, befriending people, getting information from people and stuff like that. And um, and I, I told them I would do it, but I said, you know, this job that I have in the Navy as a corpsman, I want that to be second. If you want me to do this, like that's what I'm gonna do. And that's gonna be my primary objective. I'm not gonna, you're not going to have me like, you know, in the wind or I'm just some guy on the, on the boundary where I just throw you a couple crumbs. Like if you want me to do this, I'm going to do it. And then I also told them, I'm like, do you guys know about what happened to me? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Do you know about my dad? Right. They had no idea. No way. They Serious? had no idea. They had no idea. It's crazy. They had no idea. Huh? 
Um, and that's when I realized that it's not like the movies. These agencies don't communicate right. with each other. They're, <laughs> they're, they're not. They're siloed off yeah, and they yeah. don't talk to each other. It's not as efficient as you think it is. Uh, mm. They would like you to believe that, but that, that's not the way it is. So after I had told them that, well, then it turned from a recruitment to an investigation. So then they investigated me again in the Navy. Wow. And it was a joint investigation. It was the FBI and NCIS. Interesting. Yeah. And they, you know, they bugged my car and it was, you know, it was all, it, ha it was happening all over. But again. you didn't get kicked out. No, I. You stayed in the military. Yeah. And then did they finally clear you? So, no. So what they do is they put you on these lists, right? And you, everybody. All while you're active military. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So while I was active, um, I ended up, I passed the uh, Navy SEAL NDOC exam to go to BUDS basic underwater demolition seal training. And when I passed that, they were like, you can't, you can't do that. They don't want you to be a seal. Yeah. They were like, ah, you know, while you're, uh, under investigation, you, you can't be going to any other schools. You got to stay here. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? All, that was the, that was the excuse that they gave me. Um, and then when it came time for me to, to rotate out of, uh, Camp Pendleton, where I was in California, uh, I got sent to Japan, which was like as far away from the Middle East as, as they could get me, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I was on the deployment list to go to Iraq once and then they took me off of that. And so this when I realized that there was a, a grander scheme to this. And this is when I started to understand that whatever list I'm on, this list is going to start to dictate my life. Mm. You know what I mean? And, and, and it did. So I had never committed a crime. I would never, would never detained in suspicion or nothing like that. So they couldn't put me out of the military because I had never done anything. So I was able to finish my career honorably. No problems. Um, How long did you serve? I did five years. Five. Okay. Yeah. Five years. Yeah, and um, and that's when I got the idea to, you know, to go into the the heart of where this was coming from. So I immediately started working for the government. I got out of the military, used my GI Bill, educated myself, started building my resume up so I could get a job in the government. Because the idea was, is that if I could get a top secret clearance, Right. That would mean that the government would have to reevaluate my background. They would have to reevaluate me, my family, et cetera. And if we're not guilty of anything, then there's no reason why I should be denied a top secret clearance. Hmm. And it, it ended up taking me almost 15 years to get a top secret clearance. Really? But I did it. Wow. And that's ultimately what cleared the table. Interesting. Yeah. My gosh. So you, so you jumped in, you started working on bachelors. Yeah. So I came, actually came here to Kansas city, went to Avila. Okay. Yeah. I noticed you were at Avila and then you yep. were what at uh, Webster Webster. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So you did a bachelor of science. Yep. Did a and international business. And then I did a dual masters at Webster and in international relations and uh MBA. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I got to travel around because I knew that, you know, in order to have a resume that could even get you in the door for an interview of one of these top secret joints, you know, you got to, you get, your resume has got to be, mm -hmm. you got to have someone on your resume. Yeah. Yeah. So where did, what, what job did you end up getting with the government that had top clearance? I was an intelligence officer with the defense intelligence agency. Yeah. And where were you stationed at? In DC. Okay. Yeah. And then you traveled it mostly in the former Soviet Union, like you were traveling in. I, I was doing that traveling before I got the job. So okay. that was, that was part of my, part of the pipeline. So I did mm -hmm. this program. It's called the Bourne Fellowship. Yeah. It's called the Bourne Fellowship. You look it up. They After have, Jason Bourne. They got a website. Surely not. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's named after the guy, uh, David L. Bourne. Uh, I forget what he was. I, I believe he was a congressman or a senator, but he was big and um, he understood like 
how valuable it was to have people in the government in these agencies who had actual experience in these countries and with the languages. And so he started the fellowship uh, years ago and it's been funded ever since. So I did that um, and I, I was supposed to go to Russia and I actually got, I got accepted into like the University of Moscow. And at first, you know, they were talking to me about all this money and all this kind of like what the payments were and everything like that. But then um, they wanted to know what program I was under uh, that was funding this study abroad. And when I told them, I asked the folks at Bourne, am I supposed to be telling these people? And they were like, yeah, this is, we're not, we're not clandestine. Mm -hmm. We're open, right? We have a website. Mm -hmm. So I told the folks in Moscow that I was uh, in this Bourne fellowship. And then suddenly they were like, hey, it's free. <laughs> Just come over here. <laughs> and like three weeks after that, then the, the folks at, at born, um, they were like, okay, nobody's going to Russia. Hmm. They're like, if you want to study Russian, you're going to have to go to another country that speaks Russian. And so that's how I ended up in Kazakhstan. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Man, what a journey. Um, yeah. So you, you are, how long did you work for the government? Oh, I still work for the government. You still are. Yeah. But I'm not, okay. I'm not in the intelligence community anymore though. Okay. So what brought you back to Kansas City after living in D.C.? Movies. Movies. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. So uh, this, this takes quite a turn here. All of a yeah. sudden you go from military, high intelligence, top yeah. secret clearance to yeah. writer, director, movies. Yeah. Script yeah. writer, essays. Yep. Novels. Yep. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I don't even know what I wanted to do or be when I was younger, because this happened at, at a time where I was probably still trying to figure that out. And so I ended up dedicating, you know, 20 years to this process of trying to, uh, reverse what had occurred to my family, what had happened to my family after 9-11. And once I was able to confirm that my, my need to be in the intelligence community and do all that stuff, it just didn't exist anymore. Mm. And it felt great. I was like, okay. you know what? I'm done. Yeah. Like, cause I never even wanted to be here anyway. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's what I, I just quit. I like, Hey, two weeks I'm out of here. Okay. Yeah. And, and that was it. Why, why Kansas city and movies? What's, well, you know, my, my aunt is here. Um, and like I said, you know, um, I lived here periodically throughout my life mm -hmm. and I, I, I don't know, you know, I think, I think most of it has to do with my aunt, you know, after my mother died, she's my mom's older sister. And, um, she's been pretty much the only mother figure I've ever had. And I think that's what's just kept me around the area. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So you land in Kansas city. What year? Uh, so I, I came here after the military first and, um, but after after you left DC, oh so yeah, I came back in uh, 2020, December. Wow. This okay. just happened. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I came December back in 2020. Yep. So pandemic. Yep. Moving here. Yep. And that and how did you kick off a writing directing career? So I I I was in Kansas City before I went to DC. So I was here working for uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And I was still going through this, this battle with these federal agencies to get this top tier clearance. Mm. I went to everybody. Who was your boss at the urban? Urban development, uh, Gregory King. Gregory ever, King. You ever meet Gerald Sewell? Gerald Sewell. Just curious. Doesn't sound familiar. I probably came across he, he him. He worked there years ago. I don't know if he's still, he probably retired now, but anyway, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> A friend of mine. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean. Used to used to be in a morning prayer thing with him. But, oh, yeah. anyway, so I just curious. Yeah. I don't know if he, I haven't I haven't been in touch with him in a lot of years, but mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, so yeah, I um, you know, I was trying to get into everything, Secret Service, uh, State Department, you know, you name it. Mm -hmm. And so you know, the Secret Service. 
I made it all the way through all of those process. I passed this test. You know, they got this weird exam you take, and it's, it's really psychologically funky and stuff. It's all crazy. I passed that, did all this other stuff they want you to do. And the last step to get into the Secret Service is they call it a Factor 5 interview, Factor V. And it's basically where you sit down with the the administrator, and he's got like a, a document called an SF-186, and it's like 150 pages of your whole life. Wow. You know and, and he's And he just goes into a conversation about basically different points of your life. And, and then he makes like a decision and he determined that, you know, if there's any question, he has to side on the side of national security. Um, so they didn't allow me into the secret service. It's like some of these other federal agencies didn't allow me a top secret clearance either. So what I would do then is I would file a freedom of information act request so I could get the document that has an actual reason why. Um, and the Secret Service, one of the reasons that they put there was that I had known ties to terrorism. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so now I take that and then I send it, I write Congress. And I'm like, hey, if I'm sitting in the office with the Secret Service and they say I got known ties to terrorism and they're not arresting me, right? Then do I have known ties to terrorism or not? <laughs> And I, I finally wore the government down until they had no, they, there was no other reason. They didn't have any more reasons left. Mm -hmm. They ran out of reasons where they, where they could deny me. Mm. And that's how I ended up getting my clearance. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Kansas yeah. city. Yeah. 2020. You've been yep. here a couple years. Yep. Um, yep. So I came in and, um, uh, you know, I did a project with KCPD. Okay. You know, um, after Michael Brown was killed in St. Louis, I found out that I was related to him distantly. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I was thinking about all the stuff I had been doing in all these other countries, you know, exploring all these cultures and communities, but I wasn't doing that at home. Mm -hmm. So I decided to take this, this approach that the government uses to engage all these people all over the world, but they don't use it to engage people here. Mm -hmm. And I took that strategy and I tried to engage the city. Mm. And and if there's anything I've learned from my experience is is how to deal with an agency or or a bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And so you know I approached KCPD. I studied their strategic goals and objectives so I could understand you know how to talk to them. Mm -hmm. And I approached them with this project, you know, a film project, and. Um, you know, and then I had to engage the African American community and it took, you know, 35 meetings over like eight months before these two demographics got to a point where they felt comfortable going forward with a, uh, a creative endeavor. Yeah. What ex describe that to us? So it was, um, you know, we, we wanted to, we wanted the community and the police to have a conversation through music. African American community. The African American community. Yeah. Okay. And the Kansas yeah. City Yeah. Police Department. Yep. And and we specifically we wanted a police officer that was uh within five years of their career, uh, who had been in the military, who doesn't live in the community that, that they police, and who was not African American. Um those first two criteria, the five years within five years and prior military, those two um, points there, if you look up the data on police officers that are involved in shootings, the majority of them are guys like that who they're within five years and they're prior military. They're hmm. like 1.8 times more likely to have a, uh, an engagement with a firearm than other police officers are. Really? Yeah. And so we wanted a, a police officer that was in that threshold. Interesting. Yeah. And you found. And we found. Yeah. Nate. Nate. Nate Harper. Yeah. Is that, is that, what's his last name? Harper. Harper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You want to know what's crazy? So, and so by the way, Nate, I was Nate's pastor <laughs> <laughs> and Matt Cox ended up being on this video project. And yeah. so, and then that's, that's a little bit of why you're here right now. So anyway, <laughs> you want to know something else that's wild. Nate and I, we were in the Navy together. 
Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Nate was stationed in Iwakuni, Japan. And he came, he got to Iwakuni probably about a month before my term at Iwakuni was up. Mm-hmm. But we came across each other at a Halloween party one time. And I didn't realize it in until, Japan. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it wasn't until, uh, and this was in 2007. It wasn't until we, we did the video, mm-hmm. we put it out. What's the name of the video? It's called disarmed disarmed. And you can yeah. just type that in on YouTube Yeah, and watch this video. And you yeah. did it with a rapper. Yep. Which what's his name? Yeah. Spades Lun. Okay. Uh, he's a spoken word poet. Um, and we asked him to, to rap on this. And okay. then we, we got Nathan and we wanted to record this track in the community that Nathan patrols. Mm-hmm. So we did it. It was in South Kansas city. Mm. We're like in the basement of this guy's house, you know, it's, yeah. you know, it smells yeah. like weed and stuff in there and everything. <laughs> there. But it, it was good. And the people who were there, they were, they were so excited and supportive of Nate to get, you know, cause he had never made a rap song before. Mm-hmm. Um, but the support that, and the camaraderie that happened in that basement, it was, you know, it was, it, it was so, uh, amazing that, you know, we forgot to turn the cameras on and record what was happening. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cause I, I just couldn't believe it. Like mm. wa- watching this, mm. you know? And so I saw it. Yeah. Yeah, I saw him wrapping it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. 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 And so from there, cool. you know, I, um, I developed this concept uh, that called Sapiens. It's a superhero uh, concept. And it's basically um, where artists are superheroes and their, their superpowers is manifested through their artistic ability. Mm-hmm. And it's an idea for a feature film that I'd like to shoot in Kansas City. And it would include all of the local artists in the city it would showcase all of their talents Hmm. uh and then hopefully you know elevate everyone's careers yeah that'd be cool um i'm curious where like where's your faith now are you still a part of the the muslim world or is there what where's your so is there not not a long, but just just because I want to. I've read a few of your articles. Yeah. Like I've in a. I want you to mention affection of a tiger. Mm-hmm. I just read. You just had a an article pu- published with the Boston Globe just a few months ago. Mm-hmm. What six months ago maybe? Yep, November. And called my child seeks a brown panther because yeah. your son's a uh, white skin. Yeah. Or a light skin. Light skin. Yeah. Light skin. And um, he was asking about uh, if he would be able to be a part of the yeah, community yeah, the Wakanda. Wak- Wakanda yeah Wakanda black pan- anyway I, yeah. I want to hit a little bit of that too so but just give us a quick like where where's your faith journey taking I, you now I believe in a higher power um but I don't necess- necessarily prescribe to a route to get there mm-hmm. and you know what was really an eye-opener for me after being raised in an Islamic community was when I started to travel around the world. I've traveled to 52 countries. Wow. And in each one of these countries, I would always be curious about the Muslims there. So yes. I would just kind of drop in on them, just see what's going on. Yeah. And I, I've encountered Muslims in Cuba, China, you know, Central Asia, you know, Uzbekistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, you know, these places like that, Japan, mm-hmm. um, you know, England, you know, Canada, I've, I've interacted with Muslims in places where I don't know, I don't know any other Muslims who've interacted with the diversity of Muslims I have. Mm-hmm. And um, and one thing that, that struck me about these different folks is that in most cases they were, they were, they were Muslim, but they were also still themselves. Mm-hmm. And see, and that doesn't happen for African-Americans um, because the way Islam was presented to us was through the lens of, you know, you basically have to imitate an Arab. So I understand that, you know, Sunni Muslims, they follow, they follow the Sunnah, the practices and habits of the prophet Muhammad. Um, but I'm not an Arab. 
So how can, you know, am I not able to approach Allah as I, as I am, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and really from the Arab perspective, really the answer is no, you know, and they're very keen on the fact that, you know, it has to be in Arabic. Arabic can't leave the page. And I, I look at that as more of yeah. a more of a cultural constraint and not necessarily yeah. a uh, constraint of the faith. So that so that's where I am. That kind of just made me stand back away from just taking a uh, a particular stance based on another other men telling me that this is how it's supposed yeah. to be. Yeah. 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 I've read the Quran in in an English translation, mm -hmm. which when I'm talking to you know, my Arab Muslim friends is I haven't really read it yet. <laughs> yeah. 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 You got to read it in Arabic. Right. To really know what you're to really encounter it. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So um, you did a, a little bit of an autobiography that covers some of this ground. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. that's, I actually tried to look it up on uh, Amazon prime. Yeah. And yeah. the title was there, but it said it wasn't available right now, but it's called affection of a tiger. Yeah. And it's your autobiography. Yeah. But it's a film. Like yeah. it's short. It's like a short 15, it's 20 minutes, five, five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But it tells just this is what we just talked about in an hour. You did it in five minutes kind of a thing. Was this is, so I, that actually is what got me into filmmaking. So, um, a friend of mine just, he was like, you know, as a guy I was in the military where he's a former Navy SEAL. Um, he actually came to Kansas city, last year in, in June and July and we shot a movie. So uh, he was like, hey, you know, you should take your life story and you should make it into a screenplay. Mm -hmm. and I was like, how you do that? Mm -hmm. He's like, get on YouTube. So I got on YouTube, wrote a screenplay. And I just, you know, followed the format and then just wrote some things that happened. And then I submitted that to a national screenwriting competition mm -hmm. at BET, end up placing in the top 10. Yeah, I saw that. Like second, weren't you? Yeah. Second place. Yeah. And so BT. The Black Entertainment Network. Uh, yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so BT wanted the top 10 people to um, shoot a five minute scene from your script. Mm -hmm. And so that was the, the scene okay. that I shot. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And that, that was my introduction into yeah. filmmaking. And well, congratulations, man. That's cool. Yeah. Man, you've done a lot in a, in a short period of time. Yeah. Um, this article with the Boston Globe, my child seeks a brown panther. Yeah. Yeah, that that What's, was uh that was a real profound moment for me cuz you know cuz your son's like 12, 13. Yeah, he's 12 now. 12? Yep. And so, you know, my wife is Japanese. We met when I was in Japan in the okay. military. And um you know, I'm not like a huge uh you know, I'm definitely down with the cause. You know what I mean? But my perspective is a lot different. You know, just because of what my experience have been. Mm -hmm. um, but I do carry those elements uh, in my interaction with my children. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so they're very aware of the history and they're very cognizant of what could be happening to them mm -hmm. in certain situations based on skin color and all that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I took them to watch Black Panther from you know, the standpoint of this empowerment piece, what the, the piece means to the, the, mm -hmm. the black and African diaspora, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, you know, my son, he really didn't say nothing after the movie, you know, and I'm asking questions. I'm like, did you see that? Did you understand why when they walked in the, in the scene where they had to fight in the bar, T'Challa had on black and then one of the girls had on red, the other one had on green. You know what that is? That's the flag. It's the Pan African flag. It was a lot of messaging in that film. Ethiopia colors too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, or why uh, Killmonger? You know, he broke the spear. You know, this is like uh, mm -hmm. Shaka Zulu. You know, yep. and so <laughs> I'm talking to them about all that stuff. And then when we got home, we sat down at the table, and, and he was like, "Dad, if I wanted to live in Wakanda, would my skin need to be darker?" And that just blew the whole. It just, yeah, the the whole point of, you know, pushing for this quote unquote uh, black experience for me, in my opinion, is is lost on my son because whatever my experience is or whatever my perception is, it's not his. 
Yeah, isn't that fascinating? Yeah. And there I, it is. I lo- you had a sentence in that Boston Globe. You said, I've surrendered to his reality, your son's, yeah. by not imposing mine. Yeah. I thought that was pretty profound. Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, all of us could practice that with everybody that we encounter, right? Yeah. Because it's so easy to. Yeah. We, I think yeah. it's natural in us. You but, want yeah, people Especially to a parent agree. to a child, right? Right. You know, yeah. that's a tricky one. It is. Yeah. It is. You know, people are so, um, and it's the same conversation, you know, that's happening across the country now with the CRT stuff and all that. Mm-hmm. People are very afraid of their children's ideology flying out of their hands, mm-hmm. you know, and they're really trying to hold it, you know, and cage it like a bird. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that moment, you know, I realized that I really just have to allow my son to just fly. He has to be able to uh, experience life in a way that's good for him. Yeah. You know, his experience with race in America yeah. is not going to be your experience with exactly. race in America. Exactly. So why would I? Yeah. Why it's would so I interesting, tell him? Though. Yeah. But you want yeah. him to understand and appreciate your experience. Right. For exactly. sure. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. All right. And then you, you had this other piece. I, we're going to, we're, we're, I want to take just a couple more <laughs> minutes here, but the African American mythology. Yeah. Little piece. Yeah. You know, because I, of course, with me being my whole, all my education is in theology and religion. And yeah. Of course, that, that always crosses over into mythology as well. Right. Absolutely. Because so many, uh, so much of our religion has a mythic. Yeah. component to it right right yeah and then you were what tell me just to give me a, a little nutshell of this african yeah. what you're thinking on what's so, your thoughts on this african-american mythology thing so for, from a cultural standpoint you know um every civilization has a mythology and you know there's a process that it develops from superstition to folklore to legend you know, and it goes all the way up. By the time you get to mythology, that's where civilization happens. Religion comes from from that conversation. Politics, education. Corporation. Corporation. <laughs> it does, right? <laughs> Nike, it, it's in everything. Have you read it's Sapiens? Uh, I haven't. Okay, but he has a chapter on this, on really? mythology. You, you should just you should just read that chapter. And uh, He's I'm a Jewish that. dude that wrote yeah. this book, Sapiens. It came out in 2015, but it's a really fascinating read, but... He has a whole chapter on mythology, basically. I need to check it out. Yeah, yeah. It's well, good. And but you're you saying know, the same thing, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and because of my travel around the world, I'm very, I'm looking at all these cultures and what what mythology does is that mythology establishes your place in the world. Mm-hmm. And this is why you see, you know, uh, you know, Jews say Moses did it the covenant is here Mm -hmm. you know what i mean christians say jesus did it Mm -hmm. they you know painted pictures of jesus look like them muslims say the prophet muhammad did it he's of their line Mm -hmm. everybody claims connection uh to the divine source everybody does you go to japan i lived in japan for five years when they developed shintoism the emperor sent out scribes all over the country to collect all of the stories of all the villages about their beliefs, their deities, et cetera. When they brought all those back, then they developed a creation myth that put the emperor at the top of everybody else's stuff, yeah. right? So this is a, a human uh, response mm-hmm. to the world around them, both nature and people. Mm-hmm. And what it does is it really establishes uh, your your frame of reference mm-hmm. in the world that you live in. And that's what allows you to go forward. Yeah. Well, African Americans, we don't have that. We don't have that. Marvel and all that stuff, that's a, a European American mythological construct. And it's very effective. It does exactly what is what mythology is intended to do. It's intended to inspire behavior, uh, values, et cetera, within the community that that the mythology represents, mm-hmm. right? And when you don't have that, right, you don't have a reference point. And so I think African-Americans, I think 
you know, we lack something that as a cultural community, we could say definitively, uh, we agree with this and we're going to just say that this is our reference yeah. point. It's, you know I mean? it's so interesting that, you know, because so many blacks in America adopted white man's religion, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the black church in America has really sustained the people through slavery. Yeah. Through, you know, the, the segregation era. Yeah. Um, yep. And through the civil rights movement. Yep. And uh, like I've, I've gone, I've gone since I hadn't been pastor in my church, I've been attending a black church mm. in Kansas city and went, have gone through two black history months in a black church now <laughs> yeah. as a white guy, you know, yeah. one of the very few white guys in it, but it's been fascinating to see yeah. how the, in the themes, you know, so they, I mean, they, when they talk about slavery, you know, e easy goes right back to Egypt. Right. Mm -hmm. And then moving out of slavery in there. And so right. this, this so they sing kind of the gospel of freedom. Jesus is, you know, taking yeah. you from bondage into freedom is right. a part of the story that they've integrated and how they've adopted this, this Jewish and then Christian uh, tradition, right? Yeah. To yeah. sustain that part. But then you had other people like Malcolm X who rejected that, took the Muslim story and tried right. to adapt that to black America. Yeah, and, the nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. did, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so it's, it's just a fascinating, um, it's, it's so fascinating. I think it is, but and I think, then, I think where the, the limit is though, uh, with anything that's that the African American community is dealing with, there's always a limitation to it. You know what I mean? Like you mentioned black history month. Mm -hmm. If I ask the average which I do, you know, I go to the barbershop. This is where African-Americans hold counsel. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> and I ask these guys, I'm like, what's the most significant event in African-American history? Or, you know, and everybody's going to talk about, you know, the Martin Luther Kings and George Washington Carver and the Frederick Douglasses and all this kind of stuff like that. Um, what they're not going to talk about is like, for example, the freed African-Americans that left the United States and it's, they settled and established the country of Liberia it was established by freed African Americans. They actually went back to Africa, purchased land and started their own country. I would think that that would be the most significant event of African American history, mm. right? Or a guy named Oliver Golden, who was George Washington Carver's classmate at the Tuskegee Institute. Oliver Golden was to cotton what George Washington Carver was to peanuts. Hmm. Oliver Golden was also one of the wealth, one of the most wealthiest free blacks in U S history. And, um, in the early 1920s, he renounced his U S citizenship. He moved to what was then the U S USSR and they placed him in what is today Uzbekistan. And he went over there and he did what he knew how to do. He grew cotton. And to this day, those five countries, those stands, uh, well, four, not Afghanistan, those countries' economies are sustained off, off the cotton that they produce, that this man yeah, isn't that brought over there. And the reason you don't learn about Oliver Golden is because he left. Yeah. Right? So you're only going to learn about the people who assimilated or were killed. Yeah. And that's how our education system works. It's it's so interesting. Um, I'm I'm in a clergy group with uh it's a pretty mixed group it's got african-american pastors rabbis and white pastors basically and one one buddhist guy all right yeah and uh <laughs> um but you know my my black pastor said something to my rabbi jewish rabbi friend that caught my jewish rabbi friend's attention and it says like what if what if when you guys you know, we're freed from Egypt. Uh -huh. What if you had to stay in Egypt Ooh. and live as free people that, that, still in Egypt? Yeah. Was it, was it better to be freed and then leave Egypt mm -hmm. and then, you know, start your own deal. Right. Country. 
Yeah. Kind of what you're referring to versus yeah. like in my, my black pastor friends thought was like, you know, we, we got freed, but we had to stay <laughs> and live yeah. among the people who were still in charge of everything. Right? Yeah. And, uh, any rate, interesting. Yeah. It, it is. Cause that, that's what I think. E- even if you look at like these, the Marvel stuff, right. Mm-hmm. When Superman has a problem, the world has a problem. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The world has a problem. Mm-hmm. Captain America's problem is the world's problem. Right. You know, uh, T'Challa's problem was Wakanda's problem. Yeah. It, and then, and saying. then in the next movie, a purple guy from outer space turns him into dust. <laughs> This this was the Pan African hero. That film moved black people to an extent around the world, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, that had that has not been seen probably since slavery. Mm. A movie did that. Yeah. And then in the very next film, they vaporize him. And it's because it's not his world. He doesn't, he's not a and this, these are the limitations that I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And that's what led me to this African American mythology piece. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, it's so fascinating. I could go on forever on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good stuff. Yeah. Um, I just had lunch uh, just a few days ago with a friend of mine who's African American from Louisiana. Mm-hmm. He's about seventy. He grew up drinking out of black drinking fountains, having to go to you know black you know very yeah. segregated Louisiana. And he went. To, football Houston University but then kind of got in the gangs and then oh, you yeah. know ended up at, at manager clinic over in Topeka and got out of the whole gang world and the drug world and all that kind of stuff and ended up uh, edu- getting educated masters count you know super sharp guy and then they ended up developing a program for the NFL to, to work with counsel these young you know kids that come into the NFL so they're millionaires and yeah. And, uh, but they're, they're from, you know, they're from pretty, pretty rough. They, they rough got a, areas. they got a, they got a crew with them, you know, when they're yeah. coming in and they're <laughs> not, not always the positive thing. So anyway, he's been, he's been working with the NFL for, for decades, uh, with young NFL players and, uh, has a really fascinating perspective on, you know, cause you got the white owned NFL. Yeah. And then you got 70% of the players black that are black you know? and, and coming from former slave states isn't that crazy <laughs> yeah so he so his perspective on all this is so we we, we spent two hours talking you know uh-huh. but i've known him for a long time but uh, yeah i want to get a podcast with him because he's got such a there's a movie his dad was a part of the deacons of defense which was because which was a black uh they they weren't like martin luther king jr because they decided to arm themselves against oh. But they, you know, but they they weren't they weren't trying to be offensively, but they were like defending their neighborhoods and and yeah. Force Whitaker's plays in that movie. Oh, it really? Was a, it, was, it was not a big release. Yeah, and he says this it. was what my dad helped start. And he that when I very first time I met him, he he gave me that movie Deacons of Defense, and this wow. is this is where I came from, you know. Oh, I'm going to check that out. It's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, well, man, we got to close it. This is this is probably my longest interview oh, I've ever yeah. done. It's so fascinating. We could go on and on. Yeah. Man. Well, so cool. Um, so people, if they want to check you out, your website is what? It's uh, my first and last name together. So www.khalidabdulkadir.com. It's K-H-A-L-I-D. A B D U L Q A A D I R dot com. I probably should have shortened it. Yeah, I probably should have shortened it, but you know. And your your Instagram's the same, yeah, under the same name. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so and you've got links to stuff that yeah. you've done there. Yeah, either everything. on your website or your Instagram, so they can kind of yep. check all this stuff out. And then when's this? Why why couldn't I see the? Uh, because I went to Amazon Prime to look at the affection of the tiger, and it yeah. wasn't available. So Amazon, they and I, they just they changed some of their protocol. Uh, I think a year or two ago, where these independent films, they decided that they're not going to allow them to play anymore. Or whatever. Ah. So I just need to go in there and just remove the little title card and everything. But 
if you if you search a fraction of a tiger it's still public on vimeo vimeo okay yeah okay yeah all right well thank you khalid for being on spirituality adventures thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll see you next time thank you this concludes today's episode thanks for tuning in and listening remember if you're watching on youtube subscribe to my youtube channel remember to like share or subscribe to the social media platform that you're using and then go to our website spiritualityadventures.com and make a one-time donation or you can subscribe monthly and receive our special bonus content thanks so much